Hallelujah. All right. Well, turn to Acts uh, 25 tonight. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time. Matter of fact, I'm going to cut down what I read because I really want to get to the... uh, uh, We started an area last week and kind of spent most of our time in that area. And the Holy Spirit started speaking to me uh, several things yesterday. And um, I just started jotting it down quickly. Uh, and, and, uh, and so I think that's pretty much where we're going to go. And I think it's really important. Uh, and, and so we're going to just get going, kind of uh, run over a few things that we talked about last week. But in, in uh, Acts chapter 25, let's go. Let's just uh, pick up where Paul, uh, verse 7. Well, let, let's even go further. Um, verse eight, verse eight, uh, well, verse seven, verse seven, I, yeah, amen. And when he was come, when, when Paul was come to, to Festus up in Caesarea at the, at his judgment seat, uh, the Jews, which came down from Jerusalem stood around about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, uh, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law nor the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar have I offended anything at all. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure or favor, answered Paul and said, Will you go down to Jerusalem, or go up to Jerusalem, and there be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. In other words, he's not, I don't want to go there. I, I Right here should be sufficient. Um, to the Jews I have done nothing wrong, um, as thou well know. And, and, and again, he, he just he, I think it's apparent enough to Festus that Paul's not done anything. And so he's, he's just simply saying, you know I've not done anything wrong. Why would I go down there just to make you happy, make your situation please, uh, pleasant? Verse 11, for if I be an offender or if I committed anything uh, uh, worthy of death, I refuse not to die. I mean, simply... I'll, I'll die if, if that's what the punishment is. But if there be none of these things uh, whereof they accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal to Caesar, which is just that statement in which every Roman citizen, when they're under uh, uh, court, uh, uh, under arrest in, in court, uh, that they, they could appeal to Caesar and they had to, uh, oh, be, yes, you can stand before Caesar. Uh, so then Festus, uh, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar thou shalt go. Now, um, the point here, I, I, again, I, I brought out last week, and it was just this, it's a subtle thing. These subtle things are what keeps getting me, and that's where we end up teaching on uh, are this, these subtle, these little things that, uh, that, that come along with that. Um, but, but Paul's been in prison. And uh, it was Corinthians we read last week where, where he said many times, oft times in prison. Uh, and, other, and, and when he wrote it to Corinthians, the only time in, 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 uh, in Acts that he had been in prison was in Philippi. And he said oft times. So there had to have been many times that he hadn't, that he hadn't talked about, that, that he had been in prison. Uh, so all these times he'd been in prison, uh, times where it had been unjust, that times it had been unfair, he's been in prison for the last two years. And yet for two years, he didn't, uh, call uh, to appeal to Caesar. He could have appealed to Caesar and been released uh, a, a lot sooner, but he didn't. And the question becomes, why didn't he? And and uh, and I think that there's a level of understanding that he didn't do it because of uh, of the reality of the circumstance. That if I don't, it's very possible they're going to take me down to Jerusalem. And if I get in Jerusalem again, they're 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 going to be more than desirous to take me out. So I, I do think that, that's, that there is that level where the, uh, God allows you to be uh, uh, understand your circumstances well, well enough to know I could be in serious trouble. Um, but I believe even to a greater extent that God moved on his heart at that time to get a free trip to stand before Caesar. Uh, I, we, we heard one person last week uh, uh, dis- we, we, t- we discussed that one person said um, it, it could have been that he just wanted to be a free man when he stood before Caesar. That could have been a lot of it. But I am not, I'm not a person that believes that Paul did a lot of things just because 
uh, this is the way I thought it would, I should be done. Uh, could he have? I, okay, I'm not, I'm not naive enough to think he couldn't have done that. Um, but I believe that that uh, that majority of what Paul did, he did under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, and again, I, I think we, we referred to this last week, but I feel like we have to, to get a running start on here. Um, uh, Romans chapter 7 tells us that Paul had times where he operated by the flesh. And, and it just and it made him frustrated. But he learned the secret of operating in the Spirit, which is by being led by the Spirit of God. They are the ones that are sons of God. They are the ones that move from, uh, from uh, technon to huios, I believe that's the way it is, or, 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 fr- or from just children, infants, to those that are prepared and ready to take over daddy's business. And and uh, and so so we want to, in order for him to get to that point, he had to become very familiar with with being led by the Spirit and doing what God wanted to do. Because the thing is, uh, Mark Hankin says this. I put it up on the board several times in, in our quotes. Is that is that the Holy Spirit's a genius, and if we'll just listen to him and do what he says, he'll make us look real smart too. Uh, people will think we're real smart. Well, that's kind of the way it is with Paul. Paul, there's many things that Paul did that it was so subtle that, that he necessarily didn't say, Lord, what do you think I should do? Again, I am not saying that Paul was perfect. I'm saying that he's just like you and I, that he learned as well as you and I did. But when you get to that point where you're hearing the Spirit of God, clearly you, you, you hear that, that still small voice in you that gives you the direction. There's been times where I'll sit there and I'll, and I'll, I'll, listen, like, I'll, I'll listen to people. When I was a younger pastor... I'd listen to people talk about their situations, and I'm like, I've never been in this situation. How do I give a person an answer of something I've never been in the middle of? But I'd just be quiet. And then I would give them an answer, and they'd be like, oh, that's, that's exactly what I needed. And I'm thinking, phew. <laughs> but see, but it, was, it wasn't, it, it was, yes, I was speaking in tongues, yes, I was doing that, but then the Holy Spirit gave me the wisdom that I needed to speak to them. Well, that's kind of what the Holy Spirit was talking to us about last week is that, is that there are times, there's a timing in the Holy in the Spirit realm where God uh, says it's time for something to happen. Uh, in, in the fullness of time, Jesus was, was birthed. In the fullness of time, He started His ministry. In the fullness of time, uh, He went to the cross. It was at the, and, and, and we, we use the Kairos time, it was at the appointed time, the time where it needed to be done. It was at a Kairos time that, that Isaac was born. Now again, Isaac could have been born 25 years earlier. Well, Pastor Thad, what, what's the delay? Well, see, that's kind of, there's 25 years delay, and Abraham and Sarah weren't getting any younger. And I kind of get the feeling that, like, that God was merciful for 25 years and then at, when, at about 100 years old, when he says, at, th- at this time next year, you're going to have a child. At this, at, this, at this Kairos moment next year, you're going to have a child. Uh, and, and, and Sarah, Sarah, yeah, Sarah at that time, she's, she's saying, seriously? We don't, do, we don't even do things. What are you talking about? How can we? We're too old for all this stuff. And he said, don't you ever. He brought her husband in on it and said, why did she laugh at me? Well, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. You said this. Okay, I may have laughed. But seriously, I'm old. How am I going to go through all that kind of stuff at this age, right? And God said, I can't have you. And this goes back to even what we're talking about on Sundays. God can't have you shooting a Kairos moment in the foot by disobeying and by not, by not speaking what needs to be spoken. Now the Holy Spirit, we, we talked last week about a lot of times there's those delays in Kairos moments or the God-given, God-appointed times because of lack of faith, lack of obedience, lack of uh, uh, aggravation over current circumstances. I don't know how else to put that. I guess satisfaction without it is, is but just to aggravate you, you're, you're, okay, you're okay with how things are. I go to church, we sing some songs, 
Pastor Ted talks, I go home, and I get on with life. I go to work. I go. I, I work my eight hours, nine hours, or more. I come home. I go to sleep. I wake up. And I just go through that day after day, and I'm okay with it because my bills are paid. My family's happy. I'm happy. Things are okay. 425 years it took the children of Israel to get ornery enough, to get frustrated enough with what they were going through before they said enough's enough. Before they begin crying out and saying, this is not what I've signed up for. This is not, this is not the covenant that, I, that, that, that was between my, our, our, my Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is not what, what, what God said we were, it was ours. It took them 400 years, over 400 years, to get to that point. Group of children of Israel, when they left there, never did get to that point where they where they they, they were like, well, let's go back there. <clears throat> and God was saying, I've got a Kairos moment. I've got a place flowing with milk and honey that I want you in. I want you enjoying. I want I want I want you uh, operating in. But you can't do it until you're aggravated enough where you're currently at. Uh, and, and the final one was lack of preparation. God's not going to take you somewhere if you're not ready for it. Now, now you may admit, you may ask this, and I'm just going to uh, point this out because I want to get through this 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 next section here. Um, what if I've missed my Kairos moment? Did I did I lose it forever? You know, if, if I if I've not prepared and I wasn't pre- prepared, my Kairos time comes along. Do I miss it forever? Do, is, 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 am I gone? If, if I didn't operate by faith at that time, maybe my faith was, I didn't take faith serious enough back then. And, and, and did I miss it forever? And the point is, is no. The po- point is, you missed that time, but it's kind of like, <clears throat> uh, uh, what was it? Uh, last night, um, Alice, what's your name again? Jessica, my wife, my wife and I. Uh, we were we were getting ready. We've been trying not to eat after seven o'clock, um, which means nothing, not even ice cream, uh, which is really a sad story. Um, and so we don't eat past seven o'clock. And so uh, we uh, she got home from gallivanting around Lexington with my daughter uh, at about six o'clock, and she's just she's just kind of like eh, eh, I'm like, honey, are we gonna eat or not? We got one hour to eat and. And uh, I was like, I'm going for peanut butter and jelly if you're not going to do that. And she goes, well, we got those tomatoes. How about some more BLTs? And I was like, I don't know. So long story short, we go, uh, the, the, the new Dollar General that's now a little bit closer to us than the, all the other Dollar Generals in town uh, just opened up. And so let's, let's drive there. So we get in the car. We're driving down. We turn left there off on, on 60, and we start moving. And, and I'd never turned there before. And so we're busy just chit-chatting. I'm glad to have my wife home, my daughter hijacked her all, all day, and, and so I'm glad to have my wife home. We're just off, and all of a sudden, I'm like, I just passed it up. You know all I did? I just stopped what I was doing. I got back on the right road and, 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 and turned around. It. That's, why the, that's why I repent. Change the way you're thinking. Change the way you're doing stuff. The longer you delay on repenting, the longer you delay on turning around. I'm not saying that you get on the altar, I'm, I'm such a bum, Lord. That's not what repent means. Repent means a change of mind, a change of direction. That's all I did. I, I turned around, I went back, and, and we got there. So so whatever, whatever slowed you down, change it. Start walking by faith. Start start speaking the right words. Start start doing the things that you know to do. Amen. All right. Go to Esther chapter four. I want to keep going on this here. I, I again, this is what the Holy Spirit was revealing to me. So I, I I've got to I've got to move quickly, and then so if we get done early, hallelujah. It's always my effort, you know. You know, it's my effort. Hallelujah. I uh, 
was always when I played, when I would shoot baskets with my kids and we'd get into the free throw contest. It was, it was always my effort to never miss one, but every now and then I'd miss one. And so that's one of these. I'm, I, I try to hit where I get done by 8.30, but this might be one of those days I don't make it by 8.30. <laughs> yes, Pastor, we believe you. Esther chapter 4, verse 14. Again, notice what it says here. It says, uh, now we know the story of Esther. We know everything that this leads up to. But it says, if thou altogether holdest your peace at this time, then there shall be, uh, then shall there uh, in then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise under the Jews from another place. In, in, God's going to deliver this Kairos moment through someone, and if it's not going to be you, uh, and, and he goes, uh, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether art thou come into the kingdom for this Kairos moment, for this time, for this appointed time. In other words, you thought you were coming in here so you could sit in the palace and you could get pampered and you could look pretty and you could be one of the many hosts uh, that maybe got daily baths and maybe maybe wore, got to wear perfume and you got to you got to be pampered by your harem and all that all these all these people that were around you. You may have thought that's why you got your you you got this position as queen, but it was for this Kairos moment. you got to take advantage of this Kairos moment. You're the one that God's placed in this place, in this time, in this moment, with this gifting uh, for this Kairos moment. And believe, beloved, I believe that's the way we are with our church, our ministry, is that we're in Kairos moments, moment in time. I, I was I was thinking more about the area of of how people um, want God to rush. And, and again, I, we're gonna we're gonna hit. The, I'm going somewhere here. I just want to get through this little by little. Um, but God, why wasn't yesterday? I want I want I don't want I don't want to struggle with finances anymore. And, and 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 all it does, all that happens is when I bring my tithe, it seems like I struggle with finances because I don't I'm missing that hundred, that hundred and fifty dollars. And I, I feel like I'm struggling with finances if if I just miss that tithe. I, I don't want to have to deal with sowing, giving, finances, giving to people. I it just seems like I, I struggle more. Well, you, well there's a there's a where whatsoever things you sow, that you'll reap. There's a harvest. There's a Kairos moment. There's a point. There's a, a moment appointed for you to. And, and again, all of us want it to happen today. All of us want it to happen now. Uh, flip up there, Malachi chapter three. Um, I'm going to start at eleven, I think. So we got eleven, not ten, not six. No, but notice. I just I like this. This is, now, now, how many believe that uh, Malachi 6, uh, 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 is God's way of operating? It's what God wants. That 10 and 11 and 12 are his blessings that are connected to bring all your tithe into the storehouse. There may meet my house. Prove me now here, which says, Lord, see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing and that not enough. Is that a blessing? Is that God's best? Us to tithe and then him pour out extra? And I know, I know a couple of you said yes. I'm just making sure all of you agree with me on this. Chapter 11's blessing too. And I, and I will rebuke the devourer. Is a, is a rebuke to devour part of God's best? Is it what he wants for us? And he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. So stuff that has come forth, you're going to enjoy. That's part of God's best, right? Neither, and I think this is so Interesting. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before it's time. In other words, what, what, when will your vine cast its fruit? On time. Isn't that interesting? Is it's not going to come sooner? You're not going to say, well, Lord, I was really hoping to have corn tonight. I know I planted my corn last night. 
that I really want to, you, you just might as well go to the store. It's kind of like when we went to Cave Run with our kids. Uh, it's been several years back. Um, but our plan was Ryan loved fishing. So he was going to go out. Did we go on the pontoon that day? And we were going to get a bunch of fish and fry the fish. And, and we were so excited about that. And that night, we feasted on fish. It was, what, four ninety nine a pound at, at Kroger? Yeah, we, we were like, we didn't catch nothing. That's, that's if, if, you're one, if you planted yesterday and you're expecting a harvest today, there's a time. And, and if you're, uh, listen, and this is, this is the really cool part. If you're under the blessing of God, it won't come too soon. It won't come before the time. It'll come at the time of, that, that it's supposed to come. We want it. We want it yesterday. We want it. We want it. We, we want to see that. And again, why do we sow in every season? Eventually, we're reaping on every way. The reason most times, all right, reason most times we miss out on our harvest, or, or it start, seems like harvests come only every so often, maybe once a year, twice a year, is because probably about Christmas time, we sowed some seed to some people, we gave some gifts to some people, and that's all we sowed the, for, for the year. I didn't think we had a cricket problem until right there. And we're like, we're like, why is it? Why does it only seem like I get blessed once a year? Because you're not in the habit of sowing. It also could be that way too many times you're not bringing your tithe, so you don't have a right. Amen. Pastor Ted, go move on to something that we like better. Jesus came to the man who, whose son had a demon. Well, I, I, do I want to go there? Because I'm, I'm already down here. Think about Ishmael. Ishmael was wanting the harvest before its time. And all it did was bring heartache. We, we talked, uh, and Pastor Mike talked uh, Sunday during offering about, it's my money and I want it now. Beloved, one of the greatest things that hurts the kingdom of God is us not understanding timing. Go to, Pro, go, go to Proverbs 27. This is now my favorite verse in the in Bible. We're going to read it out of the King James Version, but then we're going to read it out of the Passion Translation. I know, you're all going, ooh, this one's going to be loaded. It, it, it's just, it's my favorite one now. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 14. He that blesses his friend with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. Now, you've got to read it out of the Passion Translation to really understand this. It says, do you think you're blessing your neighbors when you sing at the top of your lungs early in the morning? Don't be fooled. They'll curse you for doing it. Timing is everything. <laughs> I, that, that makes me laugh because we have a, uh, we have a, um, a pastor's uh, uh, thread, that, that uh, text thread, that we have, and we will discuss things. Uh, for the most part, 99% of it is just us either uh, putting Rick Renner videos on there or just something stupid on there. Um, uh, but, but Pastor Mike is an early riser. He has to leave the house, I think, by at the latest 6 o'clock every morning, and him and, and Sherry, they go to bed early, uh, they get up early. They get up about five o'clock or even before then, um, at four thirty, and and they have their coffee. They have their breakfast together. They have some time together in the morning. And and I, I'm happy for him, except when he sends his text in our thread um, at five o'clock in the morning. 
And I'm like, man, I love you, Pastor Mike. I love the thread. I'm glad that you sent me that one. There's been a lot of them that really ministered to me uh, from Rick Renner at that 5 o'clock wake-up call. But man, I, I still got an hour, hour or two left at least to sleep. And I, I, you're, you're, you're shouting the blessings at 5 o'clock. I have, I've not cursed him yet. I have mumbled under my breath a little bit. But timing, it comes down to timing. It comes down to are you, what, what are you doing in the process? What are you doing in the process of, of getting there? It's timing. I, I mean, I could go back there, and I'm not going to go back there, but remember what Jesus said when, when they, he brought the demonic son to him, and, and, and the disciples were like, we couldn't cast him out. He said, I brought him to your disciples, he couldn't cast him out. And Jesus said, it doesn't come out but by prayer and fasting. And Jesus neither prayed nor, prayed nor fasted. In the time leading up, he prepared himself. And so, beloved, it is important that when these moments come of, 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 of speaking, of, of blessing, that we're doing everything we can to listen and prepare. Listen and prepare is, are just two of the most important things you'll ever learn to do. Now, many people like to focus on the fact that God does not run on our timetable. You know, they'll bring up scriptures like, well, you know, God says that, that to God a, a thousand years is, is a day, and a day, day is like a thousand years. And, and so he, he doesn't know any different, uh, you know. And, and, and to, that, um, to that I will say this, and I will say it with respect, but I'll say that's bupkis. I think that's a word. That, that's, that, 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 is, that is incorrect. Who, who's the apple of his eye? Who is created in his image? Who's tattooed on the palm of his hands? And so you think he doesn't understand how our time works? That's the first thing I'd say that is, is ridiculous concept. Matter of fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, um, says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now. Look, 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 look. He said, oh, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Go to 2 Corinthians 6 2. We've got to see this. Oh, God, God doesn't work on our timetable. That's ridiculous. Listen, folks, I love God. But if He decides to pour out His blessing on me in a thousand years, I've at least got a bone to pick with Him. <laughs> don't get, don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be disrespectful by any stretch of the imagination. I'm saying, listen, he himself said, we're on this earth for a period of time. And the times that he has in our life, there's a time for seed, hot time, and harvest in that span. Over and over again. Are you there? For he saith, I have heard thee in the time accepted. All right, there's an accepted time. Well, what's the accepted time? Well, Pastor Thad. Um, it's just when, whenever we pray right, um, he, he, he's accept, it's accepted. In the day of salvation, have I secured thee? I, he, you know, there, there's a day. There's a day of salvation where it will come, manifestation where it will come. There's a time accepted where he hears us, and there's a time that it will come. We don't know. It's just a time. It's just a time. We don't know the time. God, God works on His timetable. Well, God, God helps us out. Aren't you glad He helps us out? He said, now is the accepted time. I hear you now. And now is the day of salvation. Now. You can't get any more time-driven than that. So, so when's He going to hear you? When's manifestation in, in, in his mind, in his heart? Now. 
God focused. He is fully aware of our t- our times that what we have what we have need of now when our due dates are. And again, I'll say this, and, and, and religion is so stupid. Well, God knew you needed to be kicked out of that house. That's why he didn't supply your rent for you until you got kicked out. That's ridiculous. And again, I'll say it this way. If I'm booted out of my house because I wasn't able to pay anything and I had zero money and I prayed, I sowed, I gave, and I still didn't have the money and they kicked me out of my house and after I'm out of my house, after the clouds, and I've, I've lived in a box down by, uh, in a van down by the river uh, for, for too long, after I've done that, and then God goes, oh, 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 now's the time. God, I love you. Well, I was just build, I was building character in you. See, this, these things don't even make sense. It doesn't sound like a good daddy to me. Psalm 68, 19 says, um, in an unappointed day, he loads us with benefits. Every day, now. When's the accepted time? Now. When's the day of salvation? Now. Daily. Loading us. Now, now, now so God absolutely understands our clock, our due dates, our time. He takes it seriously. Now, now, let me, I'm hoping I get this through clearly, and I may have to read it to make sure. The reason this mentality has snuck into the church, that God doesn't care about our time, is because we don't understand or respect God's time. When He says to move, we are to move. When we are not honoring His time, we will miss our Kairos moments. I want that. When He says wait, we wait. When we disobey Him, we will miss those moments. And Christians for way too long have been missing those. The, not, not, they're missing their moments because they, they have no respect for God's timing. God says, give, they don't give. They're like, I've got the Lord. And then they can't figure out why, why I gave back then and it's still not coming. Because you're not respecting God's time. I, 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 see, I, I see it like this. And I, I, I want to kind of hurt because I, I do have four points I want to get across to you. But I, I don't. <clears throat> his, his, the way he views things is different. That's, I think, the best way for us to understand it. Not that his time, not that he doesn't look at our time, the way he sees things. Think about it. Do armies attack when the other army is at its most alert? No, they, they, they want to attack at the nighttime when they're sleeping, when, 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 when their weapons are, are, are off to the side, when they're... And, and, and that's what God, and God can see that. God sees the weaknesses in the enemy. He sees the weaknesses around us. He sees the weaknesses in, in, in areas, and he's able to get he's out, able to say, "Wait, okay, now, okay." Let me, let me give you another illustration of this. And I, I, you know, we've always you've heard T-shirts, bumper stickers. God is my co-pilot. Other people say, "I don't want God. God is my co-pilot." Um, he's my pilot, you know, and, and I, and I say this, I say, no, he's not my pilot. He's my air traffic controller. Because again, the pilot sees what's ahead, just right around him, but the air traffic controller sees all the bleeps on the screen. He's, they see everything around. And I want, I want to say it like this. There is a correct time for you to land. Not all times are safe for you to land. All you have to do is trust the one that sees the radar. If they're not letting you land, it isn't because it's not going to happen. 
there's just a time that, he, that, that for you to land. That's how God views things. God views things in, 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 in when, when is that time that you can that, that you can move into that blessing, that that blessing can be released to you. Now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to build on this a little bit. Uh, and these are the four areas, four things I want to share with you. Because Pastor Lisa shared, I think it was on Monday, a Facebook post. I, I, and I, I, was it something that you reposted from, uh, that you reshared uh, from Lynn, Lynn Hammond? And, um, and Lynn, Lynn Hammond, her area of expertise is prayer. She loves uh, prayer. Um, but, but the statement was something, well, it's not something of this effect. This is what she said. When the Holy Spirit wants you to pray for someone, remember he will often provide a gentle nudge or a reminder about that person. Don't take it lightly. When you remember somebody, pray for them. How many times have you just been through your day and you just think about Pastor Thad or you think about Pastor Lisa or you think about your mom or your dad or you think about this this person or that person and you go, oh, I hope they're doing good today. And then you just keep driving. You just ignore it. There's a nudge happening. And, and, and the Holy Spirit said it to me like this. After I read that, I, I kind of just I wrote down on a sheet of paper real quick. God knows the right time for us to do some things. And our ability to honor his time, to respect his timing, will do everything. Means everything for, for, for us to meet up with his timing. Okay, are you with me? Our ability to respect his time when he gives us this nudge. How about, and I'm just going to use this one, in prayer or intercession. Now, now some of y'all get freaked out by that. Not all, not all of us have the gift of an inter- intercessor. All of us are called to intercede. Does that make sense? Not all of us. Uh, Sister Beulah has the gift of, of an intercessor. So when she views things, she's always viewing things from the viewpoint of an intercessor. She's always thinking, I need to cover that in prayer. Always. That's, that's, her, that's her first line of, of defense. My mama was, was, a, was a servant. And everything that she ever saw was from through the lens of a servant. So she would sit there and she'd think, this needs to get done, this needs to get done, that needs to get done, this needs to get done. And she would always be thinking about that 100 miles a minute. And other people wouldn't do it. Other people would be like, they'd just be sitting around doing nothing. And it would, I, my mom would get so irritated. It wasn't until I was older in life that I realized she actually got irritated. Because she would go, why is everybody, I would be in there and I'd go, mom, do you need any help? Yeah, I do. Okay, and then she just sit and stand, stare at me. She goes, "Why is nobody helping?" And she's there serving them. She's there bringing them beverages and coffee and drinks, and she's serving them. And, but that was her gift. That's how she viewed things. Well, an intercessor is is someone who sees things, views things from that lens of praying and interceding for people. All of us are called to intercede. My grandma, um, and I, I've told this story before, but my grandma, uh, back during World War II, my uncle Alvin was in, was in uh, the war, and, um, and he was on a, one, of the battles, one of the ships that was over in, um, in that area. I, I know, I'm not sure exactly. Um, but one, one night, uh, my grandma was woke up, and, and, and when she was woke up, she just started thinking about Alvin, and they just had this feeling, you need to pray for him now. Now, so, so she immediately, she didn't know what she was praying for, so she immediately began speaking in tongues and praying. And about, after about, <clears throat> I think it was a half hour, an hour, it just it released, and she went back to sleep. And so, so a couple days later, she got news that at that moment, at that time, that there were like three or four ships that were coming into harbor, wherever the harbor was, and, and all of a sudden, the enemy opened fire on them. And a couple of them were majorly damaged. Alvin's was not. It was the safest one there. Now what would have happened if my grandma would have said, I'm too tired. I'll do it in the morning. If she would, have, would not have respected God's time. My Uncle Alvin became a pastor. Pastored many years. 
what would have happened if, if there wouldn't have been an honoring of God's time period? Everyone gets directed by God to pray for others. But do you, do you pay attention to the nudge? His time. How about sowing seed? God knows the right time for you to sow seed. Now again, I believe all the time sowing seed is important. I believe, I believe the seed is something that you can, you can put in action. Uh, you can, you can keep sowing. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, you give to seven, go ahead and give to eight. You know, I believe that that's always yours, but there are certain times where, where, when, where, where God wants us, um, uh, spiritually sensitive. Because a certain situation could be time sensitive. I'm going to share one with you here that I read. I, I was actually looking for a different story, but this one really answered a lot. You know, it really hit me strong because Jerry Savelle uh, talks about a time where he's getting ready to go to Memphis, and he had a service in Memphis, and uh, and and he was getting everything packed, and 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 while he's packing and getting all the stuff put in there, uh, the Holy Spirit said, "Go take Joe some money." Told him out. And he's like, man, I'm in the middle of packing right now. When I get done packing, I'll run it over to him before I leave. And so he finished packing. Well, in the process of finishing packing, guess what he did? He forgot. And so, so, he, uh, so, so he gets in the car and he's on the road to Memphis. He's almost to Memphis. And the Holy Spirit said, um, you need to get Joe some money. Told him the amount. And he said, all right, I'm driving right now. Day, this is days before you do it on your phone. And I'm driving right now. When I get there, I'll get. I'll take. When I get to the hotel room, I'll take care of it. He kept driving, obviously thinking about you know what he's going to, all the things he's going to preach, all that kind of stuff. He gets there, he gets checked in, goes through his evening, goes to sleep. God wakes him up in the middle of the night. And again, what Joe, what ended up Joe was believing for something very time sensitive, a now type need. Um, and, uh, and here's a couple statements that, that Jerry made. He said, uh, he said, God and Joe were both doing their jobs. Joe was praying and believing God was moving, but I wasn't doing my part. So Jerry forgot again. In the middle of the night, God wakes him up and said, I told you to send that money to Joe. And he said, God, he said, I'll do it when I get home. And and and, uh, and God said, "That's not good enough. Call your wife now, and get that money to Joe now." This is the middle of the night, and and, uh, and and Jerry was like, "But it's the middle of the night. Everybody's sleeping." God's like, "Joe's not." Now now here's 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 what God told him, and this is just this hit me so so big. He needs it now. In fact, he needed it hours ago. He's standing in faith, believing me to meet his need. Now this, beloved, if this doesn't get you, because as this, have you ever found yourself in this situation? I've talked to several people today about meeting his need, and all of them has responded in the same way you have. God ever told you to do something? You didn't want to bother Pastor Thad by coming over and doing it? Has God ever told you to give something? And you're like, I'll do that Sunday morning. And you maybe did or you maybe didn't. When's the best time to obey God? At the accepted time. If you're 100 miles away from somebody, uh, you know, whatever, across the, the, the country from somebody, drop it in the mail today. That hit me. He said, I've been talking to people all day, and they've all responded in the same way. They had something better to do. They'll get to it later. Beloved, if we don't, if we don't respect God's time, when he speaks to us to do something, we cannot be surprised when our moments of harvest get delayed. He, he, I'm going to read the rest of this to you. Because God told Jerry, he said, he said, son, there's a spiritual law that you release in your life by acting that way. 
I told you to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's why your needs sometimes go days before they're met. It's not my fault. I spoke. I, I would have. Um, I spoke, but you caused me to speak to people who delay and won't obey quickly, who hesitate to put it on uh, and put it off. You set the pattern in your own life of the way you act. Is that the way you want to? do live the rest of your Christian life. Man, this, this see this is why I, I thought I thought I've got to take the time. I, I understand that we're right at that point of, of when I want to quit, but I have these c- c- couple of things that I'll do quickly. But man, this stuff hit me so strong is that if we're not respecting God's time. Why, why do we? Yes, God is God. God is good. God is amazing. God is wonderful. God is good. God is great. Thank you for the food we ate. All that kind of stuff is absolutely true. But it's however, whatever we sow, however we sow, it'll be given to us. God, God knows the right time for you to witness. It's an amazing thought. But there are times when the hearts of people are more receptive to Jesus. Now, some of those times could be funerals or through tough times or through through, through holes in their lives where they're just looking, they're searching for something. Uh, they said a lot of times uh, uh, that, that during um, during COVID, when, the, when people were going through all that kind of stuff, there was a great hunger for the things of God. And that's why the devil shut down churches. Because there was a hunger. But churches handled it wrong. But think about this, it could have been a meme that came across their site earlier that day and they can't shake it. And they're ready to receive. They're ready, they're ready. All they need is someone to plug in. I, um, have you ever had that feeling to, I need to go tell that person Jesus loves them. And then maybe let it go just because it would be awkward. I heard that Charles Manson, while finding followers, simply would take advantage of people who were lost and wanted to feel accepted. Uh, One person who studied the Manson family said that if those same people that he found and loved happened to be talked to by a Christian and witnessed to at that same moment, at that time, they would have ended up being radical Christians, evangelists and would have turned the world upside down for Christ. But Christians weren't taking advantage of the time. Ephesians 5.16 says, Redeeming the time for the days are evil. I like the amplified version. It says, Making the most of every time. Buying up each each opportunity because the days are evil. Quit letting the enemy have time. God knows when people's hearts are ready to receive. He knows when they're at that that point. In the same way that He knows when you need to sow seed, in the same way He knows when you need to uh, give a prayer, He knows when people's hearts are right at that point. And beloved, we need to be receptive to His time. And go ahead and share. Go ahead and love. But I don't know what to say, Pastor. What would I say? Open your mouth and He'll fill it. And finally, God knows the right time for us to encourage, compliment, edify one another. I love Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, where it says, Don't forsake the assembling ourselves together as the man of some is, but exhorting one another and much more as you see the day approaching. You know what we're supposed to be doing at church? We're supposed to worship and we're supposed to listen to you preach and exhort one another. If you're not exhorting one another, you're not doing what you're supposed to come to church to do. If you're not encouraging one another, complimenting one another, loving on one another, edifying one another, building one another up, you haven't met your job here. Beloved, perhaps the reason you feel like your time isn't being understood by God isn't because it's not, 
isn't because it isn't being understood. It's because you've not been sensitive to his time. Whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. And that goes with your time. Amen. What nudging has have, have we... Don't, don't get angry. I'm not, I don't get upset. Don't get frustrated. Don't get... But Pastor, what nudging have we ignored? What things have we just let go because... Somebody else can do it. Somebody else will do it. I had somebody come up to me one time here and say, "Say, well, there's just a couple of us. When you talk about certain things that need to be done in church and, and money given, there's only a couple of us that I feel could actually meet that. And so I feel, feel like it's got to be either uh, myself or this person uh, that, that, would, that would give to that. And I'd say I, I, I wholeheartedly disagree. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe it's the one that needed to. Maybe it's the one that's been believing God for a harvest in their lives, but they keep keep rejecting God's timetable for stuff. And then they're getting frustrated. So whether it be your prayer, whether it be a seed sowed, whether it be witnessing and sharing Jesus with others, or whether it just be an encouraging word. Listen. Let your spirit be so sensitive to Him. And again, this goes, I, I was talking, I'm not going to get into it now. It's going to be a sermon I'm going to preach at some point because I just I have it written on my, on a note, note post-it note on my computer screen. That, and I've been feeding, all, I've been talking, thinking about it all day long because, man, it is just, It's grabbing my attention. Respect his word. Respect his time. Respect what he speaks us to do. Because when we respect his time, man, he honors ours. Some of y'all heard heard that statement where he said, I'm not going to speak to the ones that will do things immediately. And you say, how wrong is that? A, first of all, it's, it's the law of seed time and harvest. But second of all, if all God ever does is find, let's just say me, and, and pa- Pastor Thad, you're the, one that, you're the only one in this church that ever responds to me right away when he, when he wants something sowed, when something given. So you're the only one I'm going to talk to. Who's the only one in this church that's going to get blessed? And all you guys are going to be like, well, Pastor Thad gets blessed. What about me? So he's going to keep giving you opportunities to quit da- dragging your feet, to quit ignoring his timetable, quit not ignoring his voice. He's going to keep giving you opportunities because he wants you blessed. Let's stand together. I, 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 I hope Pastor Thad made sense and all that kind of stuff because it, it hit me strong and, and just, well, I'm working. I know, and and there might be a a Kairos moment waiting for you. I had a, I have a a a friend of mine that I went to Bible college with. He pastors up in Pennsylvania. He seems just like a a really very very uh, uh, society driven. He's a chaplain for the police department, and and uh, and his church is very. Uh, but but he he deal he deals very strongly with witnessing and sharing Jesus in public, and um and and he'll put things on, he'll say something like Marie Smith just called me, and led her best friend to Jesus, and and he's excited because she's coming to church with her this Sunday. How many want a testimony like that? Well, God's got the time. How many times have we not how how many times have we not said something to a person because they've turned us down five times? Well, their hearts weren't ready yet. Heavenly Father, I don't stand up here because I've got it all figured out. I stand up here because I'm your servant. And you're speaking to me too. Lord, it is essential for us to be sensitive and respectful to your timetable that what you speak for us to do, that we do. 
that we don't drag our feet, we don't slow down, we don't wait for the better time. <laughs> Man, it's just, just like an air, airline, airline pilot saying, I don't feel like landing right now. But you can't land in five minutes. we got, we got more planes coming in. I'm just going to fly around up here in some circles for a little while longer, but we need you to land now. I'm going to do things in my timetable. There's about ready to be a whole lot of, uh, a lot of uh, chaos in that pilot's life simply because he won't do things in the time period of the one that can see the whole thing. Heavenly Father, you know what we have need to do. When we have need to do it. Turn right now. Turn left now. Go ahead now. Stop. You know it all. Our job has to be to respect your voice, respect your time. And it's funny how once we've done that, how many Kairos moments we will tap into simply through respecting your time, honoring your voice. We love you, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.